Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Eric Avner. He is VP at the Hale Foundation in Cincinnati. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So tell me about the work uh, that is done by Hale. People who are local to Cincinnati, all uh, most of us know about the Hale Foundation. Uh, but for people outside of Cincinnati, could you describe the mission a little bit? So I think we're with like a lot of others that we're a place-based private family foundation. So it's kind of a confusing thing. We're not a community foundation. We're not a corporate foundation. Um, we're not like a United Way or something, but we're just a, a private family foundation. So that means we have a, a pretty small board. Um, we have a pretty small staff and we get to uh, manage the legacy basically of some generous people who set up this trust. So we are trusted now to um, make investments in the community that involve uh, arts and culture or education or human services or what's mostly under my, my purview is our community development and economic development work. So we've been in existence for about, well, since, well, we've been up and rolling since about 2008. So we're relatively new as far as the foundation's concerned, but um, so right out of the gate, we were one of the larger ones in town. Um, so we had to learn pretty quickly because people were watching what we were doing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And can you tell us about some of the current projects and initiatives happening through Hale? I mean, there are a couple of things that probably stand out that people know us for. One of the big ones was Blink that was over the last, uh, that's happened a couple of times now. This uh, sort of city, entire downtown wide arts and uh, projection and light festival, which has been, which was remarkable and overwhelming and and chaotic and fun. Um, (laughs) I I mean, I think in terms of foot traffic, I'm not sure I've ever been to an event that packed the streets of downtown Cincinnati. It felt like we were in Times Square for an entire four days in downtown Cincinnati. So it was fantastic. It's beautiful and so artistic. Light is everywhere. It's an evening event. So as the lights go down, the city just comes to life. And we have murals all around the city. Uh, But so many of the light installations would bring those murals to life literally through light. It was incredible. It was was a really, uh, that was one of those like wonderful moments to sort of see the city um, in a different light. <laughs> not to, not to, <laughs> Pun intended. Not, well, maybe a little bit. Um, but I think that was sort of, it got a lot of us thinking um, or encouraged that that we can be audacious and we can be thinking about big scale things for Cincinnati and world-class things for Cincinnati. So, um, I mean, that that was in my mind. I wasn't directly involved every day on on the Blink stuff, but I was involved in a project called People's Liberty that we built over the last five years, which was an experiment again on something different for a foundation. Um, I should step back a second to say that the the foundation itself is um, rather traditional in the sense that we, we basically give, we have a pool of funds and we give them to nonprofits and those nonprofits do good work and make yes. some difference in the community. Yes. Um, but that we're, we're sort of in this unbeholden foundation in a lot of ways where we don't have this huge community board or we don't have shareholders. We have um, this ability to be quite flexible and quite in, um, innovative in what we do. So the, the, um, the thought of why should we as a foundation always operate in the exact same way that every other foundation does Part of that's there's some laws around that, but but the bigger point was like we can think differently, so we're allowed to, and we we have the opportunity to, and we have an incredible board and staff that that does that. So the People's Liberty experiment was like, what would happen if instead of being on the eleventh floor of an office building, we were in the middle of a neighborhood, and what would happen if instead of um, just always giving grants just to nonprofits, what would happen if we opened that up and actually gave grants to individuals? So there are a lot of things that we learned, a lot of things we tried in different ways, but the but um, but this idea of f- f- we built essentially a an innovation lab for the foundation for five years and, and occupied 8,000 square feet of space um, near Finley Market up and over the Rhine. And it was, that, again, one of these things that was, it wasn't, immediately evident if you looked at it that it was the Hale Foundation behind it. It was it was this thing called People's Liberty that had its own place and its own staff and its own brand and its own um, identity. Um, 
but it really was sort of a learning lab for the foundation for the last few years. So those are, I mean, two things that but we do, we're constantly doing work in education and investing in Strive and all the great work they're doing or in Homeless to Homes or some of the projects like that to sort of really help those in need. But it, but we also get to think on the other side of like, wh what would push this community forward in being bold and audacious and reasserting Cincinnati's place in this, in the world of like really exciting places and and I don't know, areas that that are um, shooting for the stars or whatever, not other kind of analogy you can think of, it, just or just like really swinging for the fences. Right. Yes. Um, yes. And it's been great fun to be in a place that allows us to do that. It, it's been such an encouragement. I can speak from a personal level to some degree that when I was forming my startup, knowing that organizations like Centrifuge and People's Liberty existed was so incredibly encouraging and to see some of my fellow startup founders get people's liberty fellowships and be able to use a year of funds to grow their startups and um, to do that with a social mission was incredible to me i look at almost pretty much every project that's come out of people's liberty and support of the hale foundation uh, with with awe how did you first come up with the concept to use uh a foundation to experiment and create a project like People's Liberty? Well, there were a couple of things. One was a few years ago, we worked with the American Sign Museum, another Cincinnati treasure, um, yes. to create this project called Cosign. So Cosign was this way that we were thinking about how could we learn by doing as a foundation as opposed to just learning by giving a grant and asking for a huge report at the end, which is typical. Um, so what we did is we worked with the Sign Museum because they were looking at ways to be more active in the community. And we worked with them to build out this process where we could match up a small business owner and a sign designer and a sign fabricator and or just a local designer, an artist and a sign fabricator and a small business and mash them together, have a design competition and basically install a critical mass of new signage, custom designed, one of a kind signage in a business district in the course of six months. Right? I How love could we that. do it? And so we did it a couple of times in the North Side neighborhood. We did it once over in Covington, across the river. And it got us really interested in like, well, this is really more interesting about doing and and learning by doing as opposed to just learning by watching. So that got us thinking about well, what else could we do with our philanthropy? And then there were a couple other things that were in play. One was, um, I've been in Cincinnati since 1996. And I think a lot of the people that I first came in contact with and, and kept in touch with and kept working with, there was this group of people that, um, I probably have too many ideas, <laughs> some would say. So I would call up these these people and I'm like, hey, let's, here's another idea. Let, what do you think? So most of them would go along with it. And we'd, we'd come up with these we we build things um at some point a lot of those people were like you got to find more people we're exhausted we're, we're trying to build our own lives we're trying to build our own businesses we're this is just you, you got to find more people so it was like well, okay well how do i f where are more people who are interested in in growing the city and being a part of these kind of crazy ideas um so part of it was like how do i know there's more people i know there's people here but it was always the same 10 people who were showing up on the same committees, the same 10 people who are running for office. And we're like, I know there's more than 10 people who give a damn. So where where are they? And how do we get <laughs> yes. them off the couch and in the yes. game? That was one. Second piece was this notion of we're an unbeholden foundation and we keep doing normal philanthropy. So how do we change that? And how do we leverage our philanthropy to be more active and more engaged in the lives of people in the city? Um, that was another piece. And then there was another um, component of... A lot of cities were coming up with these civic innovation labs, and whether that was an arts focus or whether it was a, a welcome center for the neighborhood or it was a, a, a research center in a university or a, an innovation lab in a, in a mayor's office, all these cities were creating these things. And that was like Chattanooga and Detroit and Pittsburgh and Indianapolis and wherever, all over the country, from coast to coast, they were coming up with these ideas. We're like, why isn't there one here? What what's What can we do? So we went and looked around at them and ultimately realized that none of them had philanthropy in them anywhere. I mean, they were, they were chasing money, but they weren't at the core philanthropic. So we're like, well, this could be interesting. What if we mushed all these things together? What happens if we could actually use our funds differently by creating the Civic Innovation Lab to find more people to get engaged in this community? 
And so that all mashup became this sort of people's liberty idea where we're like, well, we need to find, well, let's just, let's, let's do this thing. And that also turned into a whole, that they create a whole other um, uh, domino effect of, well, we need a space to do this and we need yes, staff yeah, to do this yeah. and we need money to do this. And wh- where does all this stuff come from? And, and so we, we start like just knocking them down one at a time. And, and it was, um, but it was really at this core of, we can do things differently. We have the ability to. So let's try this. Let's experiment. Let's go learn from other places what's being done. Maybe not exactly apples to apples, but what was what were some interesting parallels that we could find in other places? Learn from that and then really build something unique that could work in this environment and that appealed to our expertise and, and our interests and and really what we wanted to learn from it. So that's um I think that's sort of the that's sort of the, the genesis of it. It, it. It's such a powerful lesson for individuals in charge of open innovation at large enterprises or for those leaders who are involved in economic development or growing a startup ecosystem or in general Mm -hmm. trying to create economic vibrancy Mm -hmm. in their regions that we can honor the individual and its Mm -hmm. and our roles as individuals to sort of dream big and have unique and interesting ideas for projects that can then get supported and executed well, If you on. think about Cincinnati, and I'm sure most cities have this, where we've had this tradition of everything being big, right? So <laughs> yes. you had to be, it was part of yeah, a big- lean innovation is well, hard. You, and and you, were part of a, you had to be part of a big company that has been, like we've been blessed with all these big companies, but there's big companies and a big United Way and a big United Arts Fund and a big- and, Big you know, cultural and scene, big, big cultural, players in the Everything was scene, big. Yes. So the, the notion of- Little things mattering and a collective, a collection of little things being a big thing, that is a little different to Cincinnati's DNA. Yes. So when we, we were putting this idea out there, there was a little, um, uh, I don't know, it wasn't it wasn't hesitancy, but it was it was certainly like, is this going to actually work? Here? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. We have to try. So we did, and I think the the interesting part of that was that. I don't know, philanthropy is, is pretty good at thinking about that they know their own, they know the problems, they know the solutions. They, I mean, there's a foundation a friend of mine in um, another city I won't talk about, but they were, they kind of took pride in the fact that they, they kept saying that they do their own thinking. Very, very, thank you very much. Like, don't, we can do, we can look at other people's research, but we'll do our own thinking. Thank you. And that's, it was just such a, a weird model to think that we would know best about what's right for the community so that even just like asking people in the community, like, what would you want or what would you do to make this place better? Whatever whatever this community meant to them, whatever this place meant to them, you know, wh- what would you do? And, and, um, and then by providing some resources, providing some space where people could actually see each other and build relationships, providing other connections and, and, and some legitimacy and some camaraderie and some, some teams around this stuff, it was just... It was remarkable to see people get up off the couch and and submit ideas. And we had probably over five years, we probably had twelve hundred applications for what ultimately became, I think, one hundred and five grants. Um, and it was just, it, it was remarkable, but just to see the ideas and the creativity and and to sort of even to for people to bring forward an idea that maybe it wasn't fully baked, but that was fine. Um, but to like listen to people's passion and to hear about that. And then we learned about issues and parts of neighborhoods that we were not engaged in as a foundation. So we, we did um, use this as a bit of a, a test on and a measure to what the work, the regular work we were doing um, at the mothership, uh, you know, where the, the, the base of the foundation is. We were testing that a little bit to say like, oh, well, wait a minute, we're, we're getting a bunch of grant or a bunch of people's liberty requests around I don't know, food availability. Yeah. Well, yeah, at yeah. the same time, we're giving three grants to three organizations in that exact same neighborhood for food availability. So why aren't those connecting? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it turned out in that, well, anyway, there, there's um, reasons for, for that, but it was it was but fascinating. you were aware of it in a way yeah. that you wouldn't have been no, without the kind of boots on the ground, experimented, it was great individual fun. level. Okay, was can great. we can we play a game of ping pong Uh-oh. real quick? Okay, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> Let's share some of our favorite... People's Liberty oh, no. projects or moments. Okay. Um, and I probably won't name them correctly because okay. right? I'm more a citizen, en- engaged That's okay. citizen I'd love to hear involved. How you them. Yeah. Okay. One of my favorites um, is Nicole Armstrong's Queen City certified work and how she 
through People's Liberty Fellowship, created the first certification for businesses to be able to uh, commit to gender pay equity Mm -hmm. in their organization. So incredible. That was was. a year fellowship for her. And I I watched her scale and now that's thriving. And So there there were like these three different programs, right? So we had the, the 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 small grants, these like ten thousand dollar grants, which were like six you know six months, do something, don't quit your job, just do something in six months <laughs> right. on the side. Yes, and then there we had a storefront, so we had a, a series of three installations every year in that storefront where we'd give people the keys to the storefront to make it into something, and then we gave two people a year, basically a hundred thousand dollars to and a, a year of time, basically to tell them to quit their job for a year, yes, and build something. Yes. So no, what Nicole did was was really amazing. And then at the same time, she was working on her project. Her uh, the other fellow at the same time was Elisa Hoffman, who was building School Board School. Yes, yeah, she's which amazing was this, too. Like she was, you know, definitely she was a former school board member who said um, she was going to like tra- train people about before they would run for school board. What's involved in that job? Yes, yes. And how to do it well. And how to do it well and be really prepared. And then it ultimately convinced some people to run and other people not to run. But the ones who didn't run became really great advocates for the school system in Cincinnati. I think another one of those fellowships, the the $100,000 ones, was was definitely, I would say, like Tracy Brumfield, who um, this is – Tracy came to us with um, this idea that she had – she was in recovery. She had been incarcerated. She had um, she had been unemployed. She had been homeless. She was like she was uh, because she had this felony on her record, um, a felony five for some drug possession years and years and years ago. She's like she couldn't get a really good job, so she was working third shift on cleanup at a at a recovery center and volunteering at the Hamilton County Jail in their women's recovery pod. And she's like. All these people who are being released from jail, not prison, but jail, the county jail every day, they go back into this cycle because there's there's the people who are waiting for them on the outside aren't waiting to help them. They're waiting to prey on them as they come out of the jail. She's like, if we could communicate with people inside the jail and let them know what resources are available when they come out, I think we could change that. So she tapped into her, her like publishing background before her life went down the spiral, and she ended up creating a newspaper – that is circulated inside the jail called Rise News, Rise Up News, which basically talks about all these, all the different resources that are available to people who are coming out of jail, like all uh, treatment resources and housing resources and education and, and 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 transportation and basically all these things that this really really generous community provides. But if you're coming out of jail with a dead cell phone and four dollars in your pocket, you have no idea how to find them. And so, so these resources existed, but yeah, it was existed. actually informing the the people who were in right. jail. And now she's doing yeah, – she has yeah. this new – she basically, instead of taking a year off of her job, she created a whole new economics for herself because now she's a publisher. Uh, she's, a pu- she's a publisher. She's the president of a publishing company yes. that's circulating thousands of issues every every month into – I can't remember how many. There must be fifteen or eighteen different facilities. She's tr- she's doing thousands of issues. Right. And it's I was just gonna like, say this. Uh, it must be scalable too. This must right. Be and so a, she's a going pain. all over the country and interviewing with people and talking to people about how she did it. But it was when she came to us and said, "Okay, here's this idea," and it went through this community jury because we didn't even make the decisions on what. That was part of the innovation too. That we wanted participatory grant making technical yes, term. Yes. But that we didn't make the decisions as the foundation. We let the community members decide what was the most interesting projects that were being proposed. The juries you almost unanimously just said, Tracy needs to get one of these fellowships, $100,000 grant. We brought that back to our official process and we're like, okay, I don't know if we can give to somebody who has a felony. So we called up our attorneys and we're like, can we give to somebody with a felony? And like, well, there's nothing saying you can't. Okay. I'm like, well, do we do drug tests? And they're like, well, do you drug test anybody else? We're like, no. Well, then don't. Don't <laughs> trust her. So we didn't do that. Right, and it was right. just like, we took this like risk, but it was a truly passionate idea of some, from somebody who would never, ever, ever have walked in the door of a foundation. That's right. And That's right. to yeah. believe yeah. in that, to believe in someone like that was, was, was changing for us because we got to know somebody that we would never have met. She's changing the world. Yes, exactly. Um, and and, and it's, it's turned access. into this thing that's sustainable now. Exactly. It, it's really about access. What's so unique about this this whole the whole people's liberty experiment is 
flipping access on its head. It takes quite a few resources mm-hmm. to start up a nonprofit. Yeah. And not only that, but to get your nonprofit far enough in its development mm-hmm. that it's trustworthy from the eyes mm-hmm. of a foundation mm-hmm. to lend it grant money. You know, we did this one thing. Sorry, I mean, there, there we did this. We did this um, kind of soul searching as we closed People's Liberty down because it was a five year project. And we, as we, we promised we were going to close it in five years. Nobody believed we would do it, but we did <laughs> close it. Um, it was hard. <laughs> you know, tell me about it. Yeah. Um, but at the end of this, we looked at, we, we did a lot of survey work. We, we talked to a lot of our grantees and tried to understand, like, what did we really learn over the course of the five years? And one of them, one of the really interesting findings was that the money was important. It got people motivated. It got people to listen. It got people to to notice what People's Liberty was about. It gave us a tagline that we were giving grants to people. Yeah. When people actually went through it on the, on the, on the other side, when they came out and they finished their project and everything, they were... Almost to a person would say the money wasn't the thing that actually mattered. It was it was important, but it wasn't the most valuable thing. The, the most valuable thing was the belief in me as a person that my opinion, that my know, that my knowledge, that my expertise, that my my thought process matters, and I can make a difference. That that, that was this this um, this credibility that, that they were all of a sudden given. That they had all along, but they just didn't. It sounds very Wizard of Oz like, but um, no, but it's it, true. It, there was that, it's and then there was this just camaraderie yeah, and part of a yeah. community, right? And, and mentorship, and the and... mentorship, and the connections, and yes. the, just the, the that the softer side of things were, by and large, the things that people found even more valuable than the money. And they were like, if we would have halfway through, you would have said, you know what? Actually, the money you don't get the money. They're like we probably would have figured out a way to do this anyway. Sure. Because now sure. we had these connections and we had this expertise and we had these teams and we had this like these partnerships and credibility and profile. So it was an interesting um, thing to think that well, okay, we're going to make a difference by giving a bunch of grants out. Part of it was that, but part of it was actually building a community of people who really wanted to make a difference. And I think that that's. It's been one of the more valuable things that, that's shaping the sort of the future work, I think, of what we're doing at the foundation is that we, at least for me, to think about a community in a different way, especially one that wants to make a difference. Um, it may or may not be that community and neighborhood are synonymous anymore. Like usually community development meant, oh, we're going to invest in neighborhoods, which we're still going to do. But if a community is just a group of people that have a shared interest in some way and those really effective and tight knit communities are ones that have a physical place where people can actually see each other and build relationships. Maybe we need to spend more time making these places to build community. And it's, it's really changed um, the way I've been thinking and of, of, of what we're going to do with, with community development and the foundation's work going forward. Absolutely. It, did you ever do any follow-up research to see of the 1,200 applicants mm-hmm. and the 1,000 or so that didn't get grants, did was it the process of even applying and putting their thoughts on paper? Did you ever follow up to see, did they actually do? We, we've been following them. I mean, I think there's there's also this question of where do the 105 people, where, where do they go next, right? Because I think there was, there was a short-term impact of where People's Liberty was like, yes, there were all these great projects that came out when we only went through a couple of them. But but there's yes, like yeah. there's probably 40 of them that are remarkable and and spectacular and and uh, you know make my heart warm. But the um I'm sorry, I love them all. But, right, just, right, but right. They, yeah, some were <laughs> even more compelling than others. So I think there was and the, measurably the, successful. Right. But I guess my the thing that I was trying to express is the act. But even those of, who didn't participate, yeah, even being yeah. able to say I have an idea and it may right. matter to someone enough that I'm going to try to articulate right. it, and that in itself is creating a culture of innovation inside right. of a city. That there's, mm. I, I mean, I would love to run a follow up experiment to see if. Uh, even if they didn't get a grant, do they? Are they now sharing more of their ideas right. publicly? And I, I know for I me, hope. even just as an observer, knowing that People's Liberty and those grants were there, I always sort of had it in my periphery vision mm-hmm. as an encouraging reminder that this city cares about its individuals and the power of their mm-hmm. individual ideas. Yeah, and I think that was one of the big risks I think we had when we were closing it because we didn't want to lose that. I think we we. One of the more successful things I, that I think happened was we did shift this mindset where people were like, wait a minute, I can do this as a person. Like, this is really, this is unusual. I, we didn't want that to be unusual anymore. I think we wanted that to be the norm. So 
trying to figure out where are there now opportunities if People's Liberty isn't going to be funding, like how do you do that? So the foundation isn't going away, right? There, yes, there's still yes, this opportunity yes, yeah. for what, the foundation. What's, what's in the future now? What well, you... I think there's we're gonna we're gonna build something else. I think there, we didn't want to rush into like what was next, but I, I didn't want to lose that that culture of me as an individual, you as an individual, like li- having an idea and being able to to take that somewhere and to have people listen and and help and convince them. So we still have like the People's Liberty website is still up and it's still um, it's still accepting. There's still at the bottom of it is still a, do you have an idea? Let us know because the foundation is going to be here. We're set up in perpetuity. We can still figure out ways. There are some organizations in town that are willing to be fiscal sponsors so we can still give a grant. It would just go through a nonprofit to help a person. Um, so there are there's still this opportunity for people to talk about their ideas, and we're trying to figure out how do we how do we keep that door open. And then part of that too was introducing a couple other entities into town as we were exiting stage right. There would be a couple of entering stage left. I think I got that reversed. Anyway, <laughs> but I think the idea was that you know so when we we were closed down People's Liberty, we introduced like we brought IOB for example, which is a a, a crowdfunding platform that actually has somebody on the ground helping with technical expertise on how to produce products so that they were bringing them into town. Um, there's a couple of other organizations that we helped that we ramped up that we provide some funds that they could use for regranting for small ideas. Um, the Give Back Cincinnati has a, f- a fuel program um, that is is that kind of way too, that it's, it's for small grants for individuals who have ideas. Um, I, 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 there's still something about that. And, and, and Yes, there's the all the people who didn't get the grants. Where do they go now? Then there's all the ones who did get the grants. Where do they go now? Because I think in addition to the the projects, and they were great, the bigger outcome of the foundation, the bigger outcome of People's Liberty, and the thing that's going to make us determine whether or not this was a really, really brilliant um, endeavor or a really, really expensive folly is what happens to those people that went through it three and five and seven years down the road? And how many of them are starting their own businesses or running for office or taking over their neighborhood associations or just- And then you can show this bigger social impact Right, that we all of a sudden like kickstarted a bunch of people who didn't think that they were really part of this community. Yeah. We had, to, to your point of, of follow-up study, there was a, a class up at UC in uh, community psychology that- interviewed a subset of our of our grantees to find out like what did they what did they get out of it and what are they going to do next and all that kind of other thing and it, it was interesting that through that uh, research and through their study which is i guess it's statistically relevant but it's a pretty small sample but they said one of the biggest outcomes of people's liberty was that people felt more connected to this community than they had before we knew anecdotally there were a few people who were on the verge of leaving cincinnati who all as a fluke applied, got it, got one of the grants, and all of a sudden decided that this is actually a place they can make some stuff happen. You don't have to move to Detroit and buy a three dollar house. You can actually make things happen here, and there are people who are willing to help you here. Um, so, this idea of, of building a tighter knit and a, a more receptive community that where people feel more part of it, as opposed to being a, a consumer of it. Um, was a really lovely and heartwarming finding from this that we didn't know. I mean, right. we sort of hoped it would. Yeah, but yeah. to have um, someone uh, basically tell us that, that that wasn't just anecdote; that was actually true. I think there's there's so many takeaways from what you created, and not just for people who are invested in economic development mm. or social enterprise or nonprofit mm. and so, social impact, but even for large corporates who are starting to use more open innovation approaches, mm. people's liberty in that experiment is such a powerful example of empowering people at the individual level to know that they can mm. make a difference and matter. So I'm, I'm thinking of this trend toward open innovation and asking the public and inviting them into your innovation process to help right. you solve against your greatest challenges. And, and in a world, too, where content creation and sharing your opinion is easier than ever, right. there there's a lot of opportunity to use that for 
lending a voice and giving problem-solving challenges to the public and, and doing that. And I think that can still align um, and, and doesn't have to necessarily compete against those internal innovation teams. Right. It's just a different, like you said, it's changing the culture and changing the way we've always done things. Yeah, you know, there was uh, there was a relief, I guess, with within people's liberty because it had to be charitable, right? So that we weren't, do, we, were, we were separate and distinct from sort of the startup ecosystem. Exactly, yeah. That, we, that people could try an idea that its sole purpose was to try to make the community a better place. Now, if it turned into a business idea, they were free to go off and, and, and run with it. Um, but if it, if it was just like, I just want to make a difference in my neighborhood, and here's how I think I can do it, to give people that chance to try and to listen. And then for us to learn from that, it's like, wait, we didn't even think of that as a solution. Was was really powerful. I, the the one piece that we, um, we we compared notes a lot with some other places around the country, and one of the interesting things that we did do um, was because we had all these people who had never, a lot of these people had never done a grant before, had never produced a civic project before. What we ended up doing is we followed every single project with a video team to basically tell their story in a, a packaged way so, that they, so they had something at the end of this process that they could use to communicate what they did so that if they decided to go on and do something else they could, or, or they wanted to do it again or they wanted to expand it, they wanted to scale it, they had that proof of concept documented without them even really having to worry about it. Yeah. That was just on us. We yeah. took that on. How many videos are there now? Well, if you go to our Vimeo channel, there's probably, I, I well, there's, there's going to be one for every single grant. Oh my goodness! So and is that Vimeo? Is it uh, Vimeo, people's liberty? Yeah, Vimeo. Sorry. What dot com slash people's liberty? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's all. It's Vimeo dot com slash people's liberty. Yeah, and it's, all the videos are there, and you can like watch these people who have like. So and and the best part was we didn't use a single video team. We ended up using as many different video teams all over the city as we could, because everyone was telling stories a little differently and could see. And, and we tried to match them up based on interest a little bit, um, and personality, and kind of, and 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 that. And it, it's amazing to see this variety of all these different projects. Because the only thing that's in common with all the videos is that at the end, there's like a, a little thing that flashes up. It talks about how this po- project was powered by people's liberty. That's like the only thing that unifies them, other than the fact that we paid for them all. But they, but the, it's just this fascinating way that you see those videos live on as people take their projects or take their next step in the community. It's like evidence that I did do something here. I didn't just like mess around for six Wasn't months on a project. just documented a grant report. I didn't right? do a report that sits on <laughs> yeah. somebody's shelf. Like yeah. I have this, this really interesting, compelling story to share about what I did, what I learned, how I went through this process. It's like you start getting some more faith that, that there's like really smart people here. There's some really energetic people here. A lot of them don't get the the, the platform to, to really act on their passions. And that was really one of the best things about People's Liberty. So if, if you want to be inspired to create a culture of innovation, whether that's for social purposes, uh, whether that's for business concepts, I would definitely recommend checking out that Vimeo channel and absorbing that and thinking about, um, you know, I I know a lot of listeners to this podcast are responsible for sparking a culture of innovation inside Mm -hmm. of a company, but um, I know others listening are economic development and governmental leaders. And so thinking about, or just uh, citizens actively wanting to care and engage in their communities. So really thinking about how we can uh, get creative and Mm -hmm. keep uh, not forgetting really that there's a heart and soul behind uh, every individual and and they all have ideas. We're, we're missing out as a city or as a region, or as a country, if we're not uh, capturing those yeah, and inspiring them. Listen to people. They have, yeah. they have the knowledge. They have the, they have the understanding of what's going on in this community more than anybody who's sitting on the 11th floor of a nondescript office building. So I, That's right. it, was, yeah. it, was, it took a little bit of courage, but not that much courage to trust <laughs> the people to, yeah. to actually decide what was right. I th- there was... Um, when we started People's Liberty, the the big goal was we wanted to change philanthropy. We wanted to change the way that foundations interacted with their communities, specifically place-based foundations like we are, that are limited to this place. Like we are not giving grants in Detroit and in San Diego and wherever. Yeah, All of our yeah. grants are in this region. So we really wanted to change how philanthropy interacted with its community. What we ended up realizing was we weren't so much as changing 
the definition of what philanthropy meant, we actually changed the definition of what we, what we understood to be community development. Yes, and so it's yes. actually a much bigger um, topic than just what do a bunch of foundations do with funding. It was really how does a community develop and what supports can we give them and where does knowledge come from and where does, where does leadership come from and all of these things, which we weren't thinking we were going to find. We thought we were going to change the world of philanthropy, which probably wasn't the right goal. I, I think we we do in hindsight, the idea of changing the definition of what community development means um, is going to be more impactful for both the world of philanthropy, but also the world of community development. That's a really great point. How interesting. I, I think so much innovation, uh, you know, I, I love that you called the whole project an experiment, right? So much of innovation is about setting out with a certain expectation of what you'll find, right. but being willing to readjust and use a new lens as right. new unknowns are uncovered. You know, and I do have to mention, too, that the name People's Liberty was something that was intentional. I think we had to have – we couldn't call that effort – the Hale Foundation Idea Lab or something like that. There was just, it wouldn't have had the same kind of impact. It would have been too associated with the foundation. We needed that other identity. So when we were actually, the identity, the People's Liberty name, it was really quite interesting that our, our donors, Carol and Ralph Hale, right? That those are the Hales. They built a bank in Northern Kentucky. Um, actually, Carol's father started it and Ralph ran it and then Ralph grew it and then sold it to what was First National Bank back in 1988, which turned into Star Bank, which turned into First Star Bank, which turned into <laughs> U.S. Bank. Anyway, all that to say, in 1988, their bank kind of got consumed. The name of their bank was People's Liberty. Oh, how interesting. So when we were looking for a name for this, we wanted something that conveyed a, 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 and had a nice tie back to our donors and their legacy, but also had the right tone and a right personality about – Okay, we're going to give people this freedom and this liberty to do the things that they want to do. That is an incredible story. So it was this story. really, yeah, it was this really lovely kind of mash of like, wait a minute, we have this name in our history. Let's let's breathe some life back into that and use that and bring that back to this community. So we, when we launched it, as many people were like, "Where's that name? What's that name? That's a weird name." And then there were a, a bunch of people who were like. I had my first savings account at, at People's Liberty Bank. <laughs> right, right. You're starting a bank? Like, no, we're not starting a bank. So, but, but the, but the yeah. name of what you called this and the personality that that brought to it also raised the level of of, of discourse within the building. It's really neat. I I, I love uh, intentional use of history to remind us oh. of legacy and, um, and and to inspire us to keep sort of adding to that legacy. Right. How incredible! Well, thank you. Eric, I'm so grateful for this conversation. I know that listeners will be inspired on a personal level, but I hope that you're also able to take some of these approaches and culture change uh, pieces of advice and apply them to your life and your city and your work. And thank you, Eric, for being here to inspire that. Oh, thank you. This has been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 